Don't let your kids grow up. Then they have to become more responsible and pay bills. And Of course, maybe you want them to grow up so they can pay bills because you've been paying their bills for so long. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to go back to being a kid, but I don't think I'd want to go through the process of growing up again. So I just refused to grow up from this point on. Actually, I think I stopped around 20 years old. Not growing up anymore. So we're going to go to Esther chapter 1, Alex, if you go there. Um, I didn't give that to you earlier. I apologize. But you're quick on the draw. So let's read verses 10 through 12. Esther 1, 10 through 12. The book of Esther is a great book. It's a tremendous story. If you, if you read the, the book that's in the Bible, and then you start reading a lot of historical references to the book of Esther. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible story. The, uh, how things unfold and things are here. But I, I want to take probably the first message that, that, that I can take anyway. There's, there's, you know, the very first verse has the first message in it, but but uh, I want to take probably the first message that really most people see but don't see in the book of Esther. Start in verse 10. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, on the seventh day, now just think, the seventh day of drinking, wine-bibbing, partying, seventh day that it has awareness, he's he he's, he's has a bunch of different nobles, if you want to call them noble. He has people from all around that are there, and they're, they're having this big drunken party. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman... Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, and Zether, and Carcass. <laughs> Sounds like a bunch of friends, huh? <clears throat> Commanded them, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus, to bring Vashti, or Vashti, whatever you want to call her, the queen, before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth and his anger burned in him. A lot of people fail to really get the message out of this small little paragraph because they're so focused on Esther becoming queen. But she became queen to a loser. I want to talk about the honor of the bride tonight. The honor of the bride. How many of you recognize you are the bride of Christ? We are. We're the bride of Christ. And we are not married to an Ahasuerus who's going to bring us forth and make a mockery out of us. We're married to Jesus Christ who is bringing honor and maintaining honor to his bride. He'll never get drunk and say, let me show off my hottie. And when the hottie doesn't move in his direction, throw her out of the kingdom. He learned a lesson. He didn't treat Esther that way. He learned his lesson. I better not do this again. 
But anyway, let's talk about the honor of the bride tonight. Let's, leave, let's just see what God will do in this place. When it comes time for the altar service, I, I ask the Lord, Lord, help, help me out because I want everybody to get what they need in this service tonight. You may not need much, but you're still needing something from the Lord. So when it comes time for the altar service, let's come and let's receive from the Lord and let's give to the Lord. You know, all too often we come to get, but the first thing we ought to do is give. And so he, he deserves so much more praise than what we could even conjure up. And so anyway, let's talk about this tonight. Father, you're great. You are so merciful. You are so holy. Jesus, tonight I'm asking you to unfold, oh God, a view of who we are to each and every heart. Lord, I'm asking you tonight to help us, oh God, to glean from this our identity. Too many people that call themselves Christian are having an identity crisis. They don't know what they ought to look like or what they ought to be because we've compromised ourselves in so many ways. But Jesus, tonight your mercy is here. Your grace is here. Your your testimony is here to create a new identity in us to renew our identity, to reinforce our identity, whatever our need is, Lord. Help us tonight to recognize that we are the bride and we must honor you. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Praise God, praise God. He's a great God, isn't he? Would you turn to somebody near you, shake their hand, welcome them, tell them how wonderful they look. Don't lie. Everybody looks nice tonight. Okay, you don't look that nice. Have a seat. I just needed a drink of water. (laughs) You guys are just crazy. The uh, when when you set the story for for the 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 book here, you have to recognize that. uh, Throughout the book, Ahasuerus really learned some things. But he, he learned he learned right away in the first and second chapters. He learned really quickly that you just don't get drunk and try to dishonor the queen. See, Vashti was criticized for dishonoring the king, but had he been sober, he would have never requested her to come unveiled before the princes. There was, there was a, a particular cultural event that was taking place and uh, it, it, in the, the Persian kingdom, most of the time, in fact, all the time in the Persian kingdom, if they were if they were going to have a party, the wives, the legal wives, were not allowed to be there because the men were going to act dishonorably. What they did 
is their wives stayed home and stayed in a place of honor because they didn't get drug into the debauchery. And then they, the, the, the fools brought in a bunch of concubines. If they were going to live a debauchery, debauchered lifestyle by getting drunk, they, they were just going to have a bunch of concubines. They didn't care if they dishonored a concubine because that's all she was, was just a toy anyway. She wasn't worthy of honor. She was just a piece of meat. So they didn't care about her. They knew when, when they got all drunked up, they knew that they were, they were going to act like fools. So they brought in women that they could act like fools with. But they dared not do that to their wives. They knew, uh-uh. I'm not going to do that to my wife. I'm not going to treat her poorly. They didn't have enough sense to not treat all women poorly. They didn't have enough sense just to not get drunk. You know, they, they just didn't have any sense. But they, did, but they did have sense enough to say, that is my bride, and I will not dishonor her by acting a fool in front of her. Because what she would have to do is she would have to remove her veil and expose herself. Because what they did openly in their drunken stupor was totally lustful, sensual, and they exposed everybody. But the king said, I will not expose my wife that way. This will not happen. And so here they are seven days into this party. What had happened up until this point is, if you read the story, what had happened up to this point is, is he brings all these different people in. He shows them his, his treasures. He, show, he, he shows off everything. You know, imagine he's showing off his Ferraris. You know, those, those are the fancy camels. And, and he, he's showing off you know, all of his Lamborghinis. Those are the fancy mules. I don't know, but he's, he's showing off everything that he owns. And drunk and acting a fool. And so he's he's seven days into a party and he runs out of bragging material. He's already showed everything. He's already, you know, you know uh, drunken bums are. They got to brag about everything. I mean, Nintendo starts to look good to them. They got to brag about everything. I don't have anything, but I'm drunk, so I'll show you everything I got. It's just, a, there's a reason they call it a drunken stupor. Because they can't figure out what stupid is, so stupor is the best thing they can come up with. So he, he's done bragging on things. He's, he's run out of things to brag on. Run out of things. And so he only has one possession left. Happened to be the greatest thing he had. He only has one thing left. And and because he's a king filled with pride, and I like how Proverbs says, it's not given for kings to to, to wine. Kings aren't to be given to wine. They better stay away from it because they get really stupid. I mean, a common man gets stupid. But imagine what a king does. Because Proverbs also tells us wine is a mocker. So they mock everything that is of value. Everything that is really worthy, they're mocking it. And so he has one thing left, and he just sits there, and he, he actually asks them, you know, what do you want to see? 
And, and he, he, he's, he's going on and on and on. And, and finally, the only thing he has left, the thing that a sober man would always lift up and always honor, a, a sober man would always spring blessing on that one very, one awesome, great, best thing that he has is his bride. And if he's sober, he's never going to expose her. He's never going to treat her poorly. He's never going to talk disgusting about her. He's never going to request for her to come exposed before the rest of the drunken bums. To put it bluntly, he won't ask her to look like one of the skanks. Doesn't matter if she's queen or not. If she was to walk into that environment, she would have been the equal to a skank. Bible calls them concubines, but they're skanks. That's, she, would have been, she would have brought herself down to being on the same level as just a prostitute, a concubine, a piece of meat. And so when it's requested of her to come, oh, even wearing her crown, she says, no. I'm not going to do it. It doesn't even show her hesitating. It doesn't say that she sat and pondered, well, hmm, uh, nope, she says, uh-uh. I refuse to lower myself to concubine mentality, to a piece of meat, and walk in amongst a bunch of drunken bums. I'm queen. I'm a bride. I am not a skank. She did know Either I'm going to lose my position in the kingdom or I'm going to lose the honor of my virtue. She chose the right thing, church. She chose the right thing. She probably real briefly took an inventory of everything that she had and realized none of this is worth becoming a dishonorable skank. It doesn't matter if I'm the queen of Persia. It has, being being the queen has absolutely no value to me. But being a bride does. And so she chose proper. She chose to honor the king. Really, when everybody says, well, she dishonored Ahasuerus. No, she didn't. Because when he sobers up, he's going to get in his right mind. And he's going to be thankful that his bride didn't lower herself to the drunken foolishness of him and the rest of his gang. So she actually chose a position of honor towards the king by not destroying. You know, all the rest of these guys said, well, she's going to... She, if she's going to disobey you, then all the wives are going to disobey. But none of the rest of them called their wives. None of the rest of them called their wives to come dancing and prancing before their drunken foolishness. So she chose to honor her God her king, 
and herself. Regardless of what God she served. She was a Persian. She served a pagan God. But she still honored that pagan God in ways that a lot of people who are apostolic won't honor Jesus Christ. She had a level of commitment that many people today just don't have. Massive banquet. The king's demand was 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 made in a drunken stupor. Some some commentaries actually consider that Vashti was not just asked to come wearing her crown, but she was asked to come completely exposed. Which one commentary will say that she was she was asked just to take off her veil and just wear the crown. And other commentaries, they go into deeper areas because, because if they're going to remove their veil, they have nothing left as far as rules and guidelines to stop removing. If they're going to remove their veil, the dishonor has already happened. There's nothing stopping them from disrobing publicly because they've already crossed the line. It's kind of amazing because because so many times we we think, well, I'm just going to let I'm just going to do this one little thing. But once we're exposed, church. Yeah. Once we expose ourselves, there's no stopping the exposure. And the exposure is public. We don't expose ourselves privately. He was asking for public exposure. He wanted to show her off. Once we cross one line, there are no more lines. So she understood that. She understood if I cross this line and I go with my veil off, there's no more lines to cross. I, I'm, I am vulnerable to total exposure in front of them. She had a wisdom about her that so many of us don't have today. So had, had the king been sober, he would have never considered anything like that. Never, he would have never considered anything like that. She, she, would, she would appear in her costly royal robes from the province of Kashmir. She would, she would have uh, had, had a, maybe her finely woven silks from the Medians. She, she would have had, uh, been decked out completely. She would have, she would have appeared uh, with, with, with all of her glory and all of her beauty, if you will. But she would have appeared exposed without her her veil. So nothing else would have mattered. It really doesn't matter how much you can paint yourself up. If you're exposed, you're exposed. It doesn't matter. Once you cross a line, there are no more lines. And so, so she would have, she would have probably decked herself out to, to try so drastically, try to uphold her queenship, if you will, had she accepted the commandment. It, she would have tried so hard to, to try to prance in there looking royal, but yet without her veil. It would have been totally vain for her to do so. Because once you're exposed, you're exposed. So she had a couple questions. Should I lose my dignity just to remain queen? Or shall I lose my royalty 
to maintain my dignity. What does it take for you and I? If she would have been tainted by vanity, if she would have been, if she would have been arrogant and proud of her position, she would have just said, oh, the queen wants me. He wants to show me off. And she would have just exposed herself and gone in front of them. And then when everybody sobered up, she probably would have lost her royalty anyway. Because she would have been brought down to the level of a concubine, and queens don't do that. Brides do not do that. So she would have been shamed anyway. So she decided, I I don't care about all this stuff that I have. I am not going to shame the honor of a bride. I am not a concubine. I am not just a piece of meat. I am not somebody who belly dances across the floor in front of a bunch of drunken stupor people, guys, and, and I'm not I'm not going to give myself to the immorality of the wine. I'm not going to give myself to the sensualization of the world. I am a bride. I'm not a concubine. She held the honor of a bride. So many times in our, so, so sad in our times that, that, that too many numerous women would comply to such a demand because, hey, he wants to show me off. Without thinking through how she's going to cross a line that you just can't come back from. Once you lower yourself to a concubine, how are you ever going to get your honor back? The matter of the veil was entirely the responsibility of Vashti. It's not the responsibility of someone else to take care of of being the bride. It's the responsibility of you and I. If we are going to honor the veil, it's our responsibility to do so. Ahasuerus could not command her to expose herself, and he couldn't command her to veil herself. She took that honor on herself. You cannot blame somebody else. You cannot point to somebody else. You cannot say, well, that's their rules. Oh, that's just the rules of the church. You know, don't, don't fall for that foolishness. Don't fall for that foolishness. It is the honor of the bride. There are no rules to this. There's honor to this. It's a heart issue. So she's willing to sacrifice her place in the kingdom. Are you willing to sacrifice your place in the kingdom? I'm not talking about his kingdom, I'm talking about the world. To hold the honor of being a bride. Are you willing to keep yourself from a concubine status to just being a party favor so you can maintain your honor? Or will you just be the world's party favor and be dishonored anyway? It doesn't hurt just this one time. Really? Vashti recognized that just this one time, even though, well, he's drunk. He'll sober up and he'll, 
and, and he'll realize his mistake. But you're sober. Do you realize the mistake you're about to make? Right. Wasn't the responsibility of Ahasuerus to maintain her honor. It was her responsibility to maintain her honor. And so instead of catering to the vanity of the animal instincts of, uh, of the drunken guests, she courageously sacrificed her kingdom. Wasn't much of a kingdom to sacrifice anyway. It was a heathen kingdom. Wasn't the kingdom of God. It was a heathen kingdom. She probably quickly weighed it in the balance and said, do I really want to be queen over this mess anyway? Rather than lower her white banner of modesty and honor, Vashti was willing to accept disgrace and dismissal from the world. Look at some of the kings of time, if you would. The kings of time are very cruel to their favorites. At first, the king will lavish attention and seemingly get great gifts upon the person of their favor. But time has a way of changing that relationship. And all, all, all you need to do is look no further than to the kings of Israel and you'll, you'll find their examples who were kings of time and not kings of eternity. When I'm talking about kings of time, I'm talking about temporal stuff. You see, we, we are part of a kingdom that is not, uh, that is not a, a kingdom of time. We're part of an eternal kingdom. This thing is eternal. That's why Jesus Christ doesn't change, and we aren't going to change anything that the Bible says. We can't anyway. We don't have the authority to change it, so we're not going to change it because our groom doesn't change. The bride can't. But if we're part of the kingdom of time or, or, or the, the world, if we're going to be part of that kingdom, the times do change. Then that, that's when you fall into the stupid thing that, well, the Bible's just an ancient book. You know, if, if people really believe that, one copy would sell for a million bucks. Because that's what ancient writings sell for. People don't really believe that. Because they're not selling it as an antiquated piece of art. They're just saying that so they don't have to apply it to themselves. But if they really believed that this is just a bunch of ancient writing and, and you know, it's not good for today, I mean, Shakespeare is worth more than the Bible when you look at that. Because that's old writing. I'll pay $200. Uh, not me, but somebody will pay $200 for a copy of Shakespeare, but a Bible? I mean, uh, $5. They don't believe that this is that old. They just say that so they don't have to apply it. If people really believe this was that old, one copy would be worth millions. Just like some piece of art that looks like a bunch of splotches. But because the author, because the artist is dead, it's worth millions. Well, you know, they don't believe that our author's dead either because they haven't put millions on this book. They know he's alive. They know he's alive because it's not worth millions until the author's dead. So they understand good and well that Jesus Christ is alive. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the, Jeroboam, he, 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 he perverted worship. He, he would be instrumental in building altars to other gods to Bethel, in Bethel and Dan and, and Ahab, man of unholy alliances. He marries Jezebel. I mean, of all people, ugh, ugh. introduced the worship of Baal into Israel. He also had a spirit that refused to listen to the prophet in his life. And, and you, 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 you watch out, you hook up with a Jezebel and you won't have a pastor.
not telling me what to do. It's because you're hooked up with a Jezebel. Ahab, okay, Ahab. I understand that spirit comes straight from, I, I learned about that a long time ago. It was all in the Bible. You're not fooling anybody. When you start disobeying your pastors, because most of the time you got Jezebel in your life. Ahab. Dogs are going to eat her up, and you're going to you're going to be consumed with retardation. You're going to build altars to all kinds of things, and then none of those things are going to bless you. Duh. Well, okay, throw the book away. Not paying attention to it anyway. Jehu. He's a man who lives a double life. He, he, he was used as an executioner to purge Israel of Jezebel. But then, uh, then, then uh, <laughs> the problem was he kept on worshiping the golden calves. Well, I'll kill Jezebel and I'll get down the, the bale, but I'm going to bow down to the golden calves. Jehu, you ding-a-ling. Jehu the Yehu. I mean, are you kidding me? I'll obey and get rid of Jezebel because she's a threat to me. But I'm not going to stop bowing down to the golden calves because they don't threaten me. Of course they don't threaten you. They can't hear. They can't speak. They can't, they can't do a thing for you. Of course they're not a threat. That's why people have so many idols because idols don't challenge them. You can't have a relationship with an idol. So they have idols because, hey, my God never tells me what to do. And don't try to get married. Because a relationship means that you have to walk together. And an idol, you're just bowing down to it and it's not doing anything. There's a lot of others that you can mention, literally kings of time. They didn't, they didn't see any further the next week. They didn't see any further the next year. They, 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 the only thing they were doing was trying to maintain their throne. They couldn't see any further. We, we live our lives with our eyes on eternity, church. I mean, you can watch Dial Jones if you want to, but the old dude's going to let you down sooner or later. Amen. You, can, you can lust after a Lamborghini all you want, but chances are it's going to break down if you ever own one. Then you're going to have to pay just as much to repair as you probably did to purchase. God's not opposed to those things, but if that's what your eyes are on, poke your eyes out. Good grief. Not worth it. And so, so, so anyway, Vashti refused to lower herself and, and re- refused to give in to her drunken husband and, and, and his drunken chamberlains and the princes. She walks into history and most people, most people read right past her and they get the same attitude as the princes had. She's a rotten woman. Because they're looking for a happy ending. You know what the happy ending is? A Jew had to become a pagan in order to become the queen. And somehow or another, Mordecai heard the voice of God and said, Sweetie, don't let your people die. So she decides, I can't leave being a Jew after all. I better stand up for my people. If Mordecai wouldn't have heard from the Lord, do you think 
Do you think for a minute Esther would have had a clue about all the Jews getting killed? Mordecai had to convince her. Don't let this happen. Well, what am I supposed to do about it? I'm queen. Surely you won't kill me. Uh Uh-uh, don't let this happen. So she has to fast three days just... She has to fast three days just to get her morals back and realize, uh, maybe, maybe I ought to, you know, maybe I not, uh, maybe I better not cross this line. Vashti gets disgraced. From the kingdom. But she still holds the honor of the bride. Go ahead and let the world disgrace you. Who cares anyway? Who cares if the world disgraces you? The Lord isn't going to disgrace you. He's not sitting around in a drunken stupor asking a bunch of drunken angels, what do we ought to do? Should I expose my bride? That's not our God. So Ahasuerus, the, the, the wine drives him into a rage. The amazing thing is you don't see any of those other guys' wives hanging around there. They're not there. You know, if Ahasuerus would have had any sense in his, in his drunken mind at the time, his soggy brain, he'd have said, well, why don't you all get your wives here too? Let's expose them all. The rest of them just wanted to crucify her. They weren't crucifying their own brides. Why do we fall for such silliness? You know, a a suicide bomber is told to go kill themselves. Well, why don't the guy telling them go shoot, blow himself up? If the reward is so great, pal, why don't you just show me? We fall for such dumb stuff. I mean, tell, telling you how great your reward is going to be. And not receiving the reward themselves. If it's a real reward, why don't you go after it? Why do we fall for that? Why is it that we'll, we'll take what the drug dealer gives us, but the drug dealer doesn't take it himself? He has us watching pink elephants dancing through our living room, but he's not going to do that. That stuff will kill you. We're not seeking crowns and palaces on this side of heaven. We're seeking eternity with Jesus. History would have forgotten Vashti completely if she wouldn't have made a stand. I mean, look at Stephen. He's stoned for speaking the truth in an unpalatable way. Paul is unpopular because of his bodily presence was was weak. And uh, Vashti, because she she was accused of being arrogant and unwise in her refusal. She wasn't arrogant and unwise. She actually kept the honor of the king, even though he was thinking through the lens of wine. There's some treasures in our heart that far outweigh the excesses of the world. Alfred Tennyson wrote wrote these words about Vashti. He said, self-reverence, self-knowledge, self-control. These three alone lead life to sovereign power. Yet not 
for power, power by herself would come uncalled for, but to live by law. Acting the law, we live without fear, and because right is right, to follow right, we're wisdom in the scorn of consequence. When, when you really read the story, Vashti regarded the dignity of her soul more than the shine of the crown. Fashion and popularity are, are a poor, poor price to pay for the loss of a testimony. Godly principles, modesty, holiness, are, they, they might be deemed old-fashioned, but they're deemed old-fashioned by people who simply don't want to have a relationship that's honorable. I just want a playful relationship with Jesus. I don't want a marriage. When did it become acceptable to be a spiritual concubine instead of to bear the honor of the bride? It's still not acceptable. Not to the Lord. Because our Lord don't have no concubines. He only has a bride. He doesn't play the concubine game. Standing, Richard Exley, I don't know if anybody of you ever heard of Richard Exley. He, he, he wrote a book called Deliver Me. He wrote several books, but um, he... he he says that he grew up in a in a church that uh, that was very conservative and 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 everything and, and anyway he he relates a story that on on one Saturday afternoon in Texas City Texas does that still exist Texas City Texas but um, but anyway he 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 had to face a series of choices he was a member of the eighth grade eighth grade basketball team eighth grade how many eighth graders do we have here one that's it. That's all we have is one eighth grader tonight. Your Lydia's in the she's in eighth grade. So, and Alex, I was wondering who they're pointing to. They're all pointing, and and there's Alex up there in the sound booth. Eighth grade. So we have three eighth graders here tonight. That's all. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, so he, he's in eighth grade basketball team. They they're playing in an out of town tournament. After winning the first two games, they had a Saturday afternoon open before playing for the tournament championship that evening. So they had they had a, an afternoon open. Uh, Coach Johnson decided that a movie was the best way to keep the boys out of trouble until game time. The the team greeted the announcement with loud cheers. Ah, oh, but he didn't join in. For him, it became a moment of truth. Would he remain true to his spiritual convictions or would he give in to peer pressure? To fully appreciate his situation, a person must realize that his, his church, uh, the, the church and the youth that he was in the church um, were, were, con were, were very conservative, staunchly conservative, he writes, saying that liquor and cigarettes were deadly sins, but so was dancing and going to movies. There's no difference. And so to his way of thinking, stepping inside a movie theater was tantamount to denying Jesus Christ. So all the way across town to the theater, he was in mortal agony. Attending the movie with the team was not an option. He just, uh, he, he, he had to do it. Or he, and so, but, but he dreaded the ridicule and the rejection that, that, that he was sure to endure that, that would follow his stand. At last, the bus turns into the parking lot, comes to a stop. Uh, around Richard, the team was talking noisily, pushing forward to the front of the bus. And he hung back, hoping for a chance to, to, to finally talk to Coach Johnson privately. He wanted to talk to him privately. Uh, it, it didn't happen. Ordering everyone back to their seats, he writes, Coach began to uh, give some last-minute instructions. Finally, he asked if anyone had any questions, and reluctantly, he said, I raised my hand, and nodding in direction, Coach said, what is it, Exley? Every eye's on him, he swallows hard, past the fear form, he says, a fist-sized lump in my throat, and, and, and a voice that was hardly more than a whisper, Coach, it's against my religion to go to a movie. So, what'd you say? The coach demanded, speak up so I can hear you. So he <clears throat> clears his throat and he blurts, I'm not going to any movie. It's against my religion. 
Instantly, the bus erupted with excited chatter as his teammates bombarded him with questions and comments. You got to be kidding me. What kind of church do you go to anyway? What's, what's wrong with going to a movie? And he said with, a, with embarrassment painted on his face, bright red, but, but he didn't back down. Finally, the coach ordered the rest of the team off the bus. And when they were gone, he made his way back to the seat in front of where Richard was sitting, put his arm on the back of the seat. He looked at Richard for a long time without speaking. Exley, he finally asked, If I let you stay on the bus, will you give me your word that you won't set one foot off of it? Without a moment's hesitation, he says, yes, sir. He says, we're going to be gone for two hours. It's a long time with nothing to do. He says, I'll be fine, sir. I told him, and you can trust me. So he gave me one final look before making his way down the aisle and stepping outside where the rest of the team waited impatiently. He watched until they turned the corner and disappeared from sight, and then he settled down to await their return. Exley continues to write, How, you may be wondering, could a timid 14-year-old boy remain true to his convictions? He goes on and says, While the man that I became a minister and a writer caved in at a rental car company. Now, earlier on in the book, he tells a story that that he he lied about the mileage and, and, and gas that he didn't put in the car. And, uh, so he didn't have to pay extra fees and said that he, it, it bothered him so much finally that he had to he had to send a rental car company a long apology and then he he paid them twice as much as what they would have charged him because he just felt uh, a, a lie is worth a penalty but he goes on and says yeah how, how did i how did i do that he says he says that afternoon i i, I prayed desperately for the courage to do what was right. He says, a young man, I had no confidence in myself. I needed Jesus. He says, but as an adult with different life experiences and, and, and having gained confidence in myself, I tried to live in my own power and didn't trust Jesus anymore and found myself to fail time and again putting confidence in myself. He says, but when I was 14, I knew if I didn't have Jesus, I didn't have anything. And he goes on, he writes a, a long chapter about how uh, the, the book is called Deliver Me. It's it's worth It's worth getting and reading it's really a good book but he goes on and writes about how 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 the older he got the less wisdom he really had because the older he got the more he compromised because he put more confidence in himself and took it away from Jesus this is a guy who's who, who was a preacher he grew up to be a preacher And said, I finally had to get to a point where I had to seek childlike faith again. Where I had, to, I had to have Jesus. He had to be everything to me. I couldn't try to do things on my own. As a midlife male, he says, I must return to the faith of my childhood. Like a 14-year-old boy, I must take a stand against all evil. It's my only hope. He says, I dare not open my heart to the smallest temptation. For once the door is open, it's almost impossible to close. And I must not stand in my own strength or I will surely fail. Like a child, I must put my whole trust in Jesus. For he only knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Would you stand with me?
I'd like to give you a few examples of those who removed the veil. Those who dishonored themselves as Peter being the bride. Judas is one of them that comes to mind immediately. Would you gather at the altar tonight? How, how is it possible for someone to discard their veil or their honor and to experience the anointing and to genuinely experience the presence, but to escape the transforming impact of God. Judas is chosen after a night of prayer in the Lord's presence with the temple. Throughout three years of ministry, witnessing the majesty of the miraculous and I don't really know of anybody here tonight that hasn't seen the majestic power of the miraculous. We walk in it daily. It surrounds us. But you finally get a glimpse of Judas when when Mary breaks the alabaster box. Pours it over the head of Jesus and you get a good look at him after three years of being absorbed and surrounded by the anointed one, being completely consumed by the presence of God. After three years of walking with daily miracles, we get a glimpse of a man who pushed it away. Who exposed himself from being from the honor of being the bride. He became incensed. He, we, 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 see that, we, we see that the anger that he spews because, because of the cost of the oil in the box. He was putting so much value on that oil and he was devaluing the miraculous identity, and manifestation surrounding him. All these manifestations, all these miracles, all the might and the glory had failed to change him. He didn't carry the honor of the bride. He prostituted himself to the cost of perfume. Did he really feel it? I wonder, did, did, he, did he feel it? When the presence of the Lord left him? Did he, did, he, did he feel it when the Lord sent him out? The night of the betrayal? Did he feel it? Because somehow or another it appears that he was so intoxicated with the fact that he needed silver more than he needed honor. Thirty pieces of silver that when he sobered up and realized what he had done, he couldn't even hold on to. So often we get intoxicated with with thinking that we need something so bad that we will dishonor being the bride. Only to sober up from our stupor and recognize it wasn't worth it. Watch him at the betrayal. Watch him bartering with the priests for the money. Watch him finally die at his own hand. All those 30 lousy pieces of silver by a graveyard for paupers. All we have to do is 
follow what Ju Judas did and we will receive the results Judas received. Samson, nobody can deny Samson knew what it was like to experience the power of God. I mean, miraculous feats, legendary accomplishments that this man would do, find our way into the records of the judges and the spirit that came upon Samson at times, the, the, the things that he performed, the incredible things with superhuman strength, a measure that, that he even pursued the pleasure of Jehovah, but the haunting reality that manifests itself on him. The lust that he fell into that exposed him, that dishonored him and killed him. We see that this, this mighty man becomes vulnerable. Peter, I mean, he, he, P Peter's the guy who, he, he's, he receives the keys of the kingdom with his fantastic declaration that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and he even says, well, we're not go we can't go anywhere else. You're the only one that has the, the words of eternal life. I mean, Peter, Peter makes such incredible declarations that, 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 that get recorded in the scripture that, that, that we, we preach the, the phenomenal things that he preached and, and the results. I mean, the, the, just the, the day of Pentecost. Brought over 3,000 souls. Peter preaching. I mean, the amazing thing. His garments glistening white. I mean, this guy, he's, yeah! He's a wild man. Even on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, it's good that we're here. Let's build three tabernacles. Let's get it done. Let's, uh, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Let's get it done. Let's go, let's go, let's go. But Peter experiences the glory of God, the disciples, right down to Gethsemane. He gets to experience deeper things than, than many of the other disciples get to experience right down to Gethsemane. He's right there when the Lord's casting out demons and, 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 and he's, he gets to see it all. And, and, then, and then finally, when Jesus is arrested and others identified him as being part of the bride, he said, uh-uh, not me. He ends up finally cursing, saying, no, I don't know him. Of course, we know he received mercy. He, he was done. He, he went back to fishing. And the Lord, after his resurrection, comes back and says, hey, pal, I'm not done with you. See, he wasn't Judas. He didn't go out and kill himself. He wasn't Samson. He, he didn't end his life by, by, by killing all of his enemies. He, he, he was Peter. He, he did, he, there was still a chance as long as he was still breathing. The Lord would have done the same thing for Judas or Samson had they, had they not taken their own lives. Just like he'll do for you and I here. Because we're here. Because we're in his presence. Because we may have done some dishonorable things. But the world is so done with us. And I'm done with the world. 
We could talk about the five wise and five foolish virgins. We could, we could carry on. We could talk about Paul and, and different things where Paul ended up saying, I, I fought a good fight. He was on the road to Damascus. He was killing Christians when the Lord got a hold of him. He, he, he never lost his zeal. He, he just changed the object that he was zealous for. He apply, it's, it's amazing what you'll do when a name gets attached when a name is revealed to you it's amazing what a name can do he says who are you and he says I am Jesus and right there Saul of Tarsus says I'll do anything now that I've got your name as we bow our heads and we begin to pray. You know, we're, all, we're all at different stages of, of our relationship with the Lord. Some of us are struggling. Some of us feel shame. Some of us feel guilt. Some of us feel, feel like there, there's no way in the world we can, we can do this. Some of us are, you know, there, there's, there's even a spirit of rebellion in this place tonight. I don't know if you can feel it, but it, 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 I can feel it around this altar. We need to get rid of that. Because at the end of the day, I have to remain a bride with honor. I can't prostitute myself. I can't compromise myself. I can't look at the, 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 the drunken mockery of the world and say, well, it, you know, they won't remember if I cross this line. We're not doing it for them. We're doing it for Him. So would you begin to pray with me right now? The Spirit of the Lord wants to do something here. He wants to do something across this altar tonight. Let's just begin to pray and Maybe you're feeling really good and connected to the Lord right now. Why don't you just begin to praise Him and begin to worship Him and and, and allow Him to start to speak to you about ministering to somebody else tonight. This is not a night to look around. This is not a night to, to, to try.